Good morning, everyone. I think we're just having everybody join us still. It's a pleasure to see everyone this morning and welcome to the Cooperative Party Annual Equalities Conference. Um, we have a wonderful lineup today and we're really looking forward to hearing from all of our speakers. Um, I'm going to begin with a few uh, housekeeping matters. Um, this event is being recorded so that it can be played back later, um, hopefully on our YouTube channel. We will also have uh, the entire event will be closed captioned. So if you do need that, you can click the show captions button down at the bottom. Um, if your uh, Zoom like mine has just updated, you might need to do a little bit of searching to find the buttons because some of them have moved. Um, we also will be having everybody on mute. If you have any questions and you want to send those through, they will come through to the co-hosts and the chairs, and they will then be fed in for the appropriate Q&A sessions. Um, Welcome and join us uh, for a lovely time today. I'm going to begin by handing over to uh, Councillor Ellie Ormsby, who is our uh, NEC rep for the Youth Committee, and she is going to be chairing our first session today. So over to you, Ellie. Oh, good morning, everyone. And yes, like you say, I'm Ellie Ormsby and I'm the Youth Representative on the Cooperative Party's National Executive Committee. And I am absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker, Annalise Dodds MP, who is the first Cooperative Minister for Women and Equalities. I'll hand over to Annalise shortly and then we're going to have opportunity for some Q&A afterwards. So get your questions ready. I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll hand over. Well, thank you ever so much, Ellie, and Jennifer as well, and to everyone who is on this call for this really important conference. My goodness, it's great to be together again. We were just reflecting on when we last met uh, together and so proud of what the Co-op Party has achieved in the intervening 12 months. Um, and also of the fact that, as was mentioned, I am the first Cooperative Minister for Women and Equalities. We have had, of course, cooperators who've been Ministers for International Development, which is my other role, uh, something I'll come on to in a moment, but really delighted to be here at this Equalities Conference. And of course, I know that promoting equality has always been fundamental for the Cooperative Party. It's always been fundamental for cooperators. It's absolutely at the heart of our values. It's been there since uh, the time of the Rochdale pioneers right back in 1844. It really is what makes us tick. Um, and I think it's been really powerful to see the cooperative parties, equalities networks developing all of that work and really crystallising it over the last few years. Of course, as many of you know, now we have in the cooperative party five equalities networks, the network for black, Asian and minority ethnic cooperators, the disability network, cooperative party women, also the youth network, as was just mentioned, and LGBTQ plus cooperators. And there's a dedicated equalities officer as well, supporting all of that work, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think we've seen partly because of those networks, because of the cooperative party's commitment to equality, that really feeding through into the representation that we have now, both in councils, and so great again to have uh, Ellie and Jennifer with us, but also, of course, the representation that we've seen in Parliament. And all of you, I'm sure, will know the headlines here around what we've achieved. Uh, Labour now having the most gender balanced representation that we've ever had in Parliament, creating a record in the House of Commons. Unfortunately, not all parties uh, moving as fast as we have, but nonetheless, a record number of women in the Westminster Parliament. We also see the biggest representation of LGBT MPs of any uh, Parliament. So now a group that is 50 uh, people strong. Um, and also our Parliament has broken the previous record for representation of ethnic minority people as well. And of course, we've had many firsts. Uh, for the first time in 800 years, we have a woman chancellor who has delivered a budget in the shape of the amazing uh, Rachel Reeves. So really lots of change that has been achieved. Thanks to all of your 
hard work, campaigning and support for each other based on those cooperative values. Um, but of course, we need now to make sure that we're delivering in policy terms. I know that you're all committed to this and we talked about it the last time that we met together. Um, you all know that previous Labour governments have been determined to push forward on equality, whether that was the Race Relations Act, whether it was uh, the measures for LGBT equality, um, uh, the many measures taken for women. Well, now we need to be, of course, pushing that forward and building on, of course, the 2010 Equality Act. And that is fundamental to the different missions that Keir Starmer set out sometime before the election and which we're now delivering on. Uh, that mission, for example, to uh, have the level of violent crime in the UK includes a commitment, as many of you will know, to have violence against women and girls. And much of that, of course, is building on the amazing work of some of our Labour and Cooperative Police and Crime Commissioners who achieved so much, even with a Conservative government. Well, we're taking their lessons that they developed and putting them in practice nationally. We're also, of course, determined to improve the affordability and availability of childcare. I'm very well aware of all the work that cooperatives have done in this area. In fact, my own children uh, attended cooperative childcare as little pioneers. Uh, so proud of that name. We are obviously seeking to make sure that we're catalyzing much better provision of childcare into the future. And we're also making sure that we are improving people's rights at work. Uh, all the work that went in, of course, the New Deal for Working People um, now being taken forward, including in the Employment Rights Bill and building there on the actions of so many really good businesses up and down the country, including very often cooperative businesses and the way in which they have recognised that greater rights at work often lead to greater productivity, stronger economic growth and to businesses being more sustainable. Um, and also, of course, as well as making sure that we're delivering on the areas of equality that I just mentioned, we need to be making sure overall our society is less divided socio-economically as well. That's why we've committed, for example, to enacting the socio-economic duty, which many cooperative councils actually have already decided they want to adopt. Um, but also it's why within our opportunity mission, we're really determined to be acting on intergenerational income inequality. So the extent to which your parents' income then has a bearing on your income. And again, I know this is really important to many cooperators. We've seen all the action, for example, within uh, the cooperative college and the Co-op Academies Trust really focusing on providing far better opportunities for our children and young people, in particularly in some of the UK's most deprived communities. So um, lots of change that we need to drive forward. And of course, we need to be driving it forward nationally, but internationally as well. And I'm really pleased to be combining the roles of Minister for Women and Equalities and Minister for International Development. Um, and it's enabling me, I think, to ensure that we are putting equality at the heart of our development strategy, um, making sure that uh, women and girls are not forgotten, that they are considered from the very beginning. And that's particularly important as we see a rollback of women and girls' uh, rights and protections across the world. Uh, we really need to make sure that we are facing up to these challenges and practically doing what we can to support women and girls. And when we do that, of course, that's positive for everyone. We know that an economy about the size of the US economy is missing from global output because we don't have women able to work to the same extent as men, able to earn to the same extent as men. That's about a 20% gap in GDP that could be filled if we were empowering uh, women and before them girls. The global cooperative movement here has a really important role to play in reducing inequality and improving conditions for everyone. Um, and we're talking here about, you know, not just a nice to have, but an absolutely fundamental element of change. Um, the cooperative movement makes up 2.4 trillion pounds globally. That is actually, if you consider it in relation to countries, the eighth biggest economy 
in the world. This really is fundamental to delivering change. And we've seen cooperatives having an enormous impact globally. Um, if you look, for example, at the impact of India's dairy cooperatives, um, they produce, some estimates would suggest, up to a quarter of the world's milk in a way that is equitable for local producers. What an enormous change that has delivered. Um, another really positive example is the case of cooperatives in Rwanda, where uh, many of them are focused on women's empowerment that's been particularly important. So I think the power of the cooperative model, both domestically and internationally, really cannot be underestimated when it comes to delivering on those values of promoting equality. And now's a really important time for us to be having this conversation. One of many reasons why I'm so delighted to be uh, part of this conference again with all of you. Next year is the UN Year of Cooperatives. And I think that will be a great opportunity for us to be really promoting uh, that cooperative message. So very much appreciate being here with all of you again. Looking forward uh, to the Q&A and just want to wish all power to your elbows, cooperators. Um, keep doing what you're doing and let's intensify and energise it. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, and I think it was fantastic to hear about how we're harnessing our record breaking diversity within par Parliament to actually deliver for minorities and underrepresented peoples, both at home and abroad. And I think, as you say, bringing together the international development and equalities in a single brief is hopefully going to be really impactful. Um, so everyone, if you would like to ask a question, either raise your hand or as Jen has posted in the chat, um, you can post your questions in the chat there and I will aim to ask those questions in, in freeze so we can get through as many questions as possible today. But while everyone gets their questions ready, I did want to ask up front, you know, there are there are real, real concerns about the advancement of women's rights internationally, especially, you know, with news from the US this week, women's reproductive rights. What do you think will be the biggest challenge to this over the coming years? And what do you think the Labour government can do? So we, we have seen um, that rollback on women's and girls' rights globally. And it's really important, I think, here that we're crystal clear about the importance of, for example, sexual and reproductive health and rights. Um, they're important, obviously, for individual women. They can make such a huge difference, no question about that. But they're also absolutely fundamental for all of society. You know, this isn't about one group of people um, having that, that freedom uh, to choose or to have access to health care and then that being denied to others, it's quite the opposite. If you have societies that have, for example, high levels of maternal mortality um, because of a lack of access to healthcare, because of a lack of access to reproductive services, that is going to have an enormous impact on the rest of society. Um, you know, recently uh, I visited uh, South Sudan, where the maternal mortality rate is the highest in the world. Now, that is obviously a tragedy for every single woman who has died, but it also has an enormous impact on the rest of their family, on the children who are left behind, uh, on the economy of that country as well. It has a huge mental health impact and psychological impact that carries forward for an extremely long time. So we need to be clear that this is an economic imperative um, as well as of course, making the moral case. And I think we are seeing uh, some positive developments even while there are challenges. I think that evidence base now could not be clearer actually. And I was at the World Bank uh, annual meetings a couple of weeks ago in Washington. And I was really pleased that there was agreement actually to recognize the importance of empowering women and girls as an economic strategy. And, and that was adopted uh, across nations. Um, we also saw it reflected in the Pact for the Future, uh, which is the kind of UN agreement that was made a couple of weeks before that in New York. So yes, there are, of course, challenges globally, but I think we have to focus on the fact that we can actually work with new allies, we can pull together and we can deliver, especially when we're so clear as we need to be about the economic impact of failing uh, to deliver on these issues for women and girls. No, thank you. And yeah, I agree. Seeing the less as just women's issues and issues for society to address, I think is hopefully how we can win the argument there. 
Um, I spot three, three people with their hand up. So I wonder whether I can take Ivan, Ellie and Erica in that order if possible. I don't know, Ivan, are you able to unmute yourself? Go ahead. Thank you very much. I've just unmuted. And uh, hello, Minister. Um, people with oh. autism really need to get much more involved with politics. Uh, autistic people have unique life experiences and insights to what is happening in the UK and the world as a whole. Uh, after 14 years of Tory destruction, we really need adult autism support services. What mm. steps are being taken to provide adult autism support services and to get more autistic people involved with politics? Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ivan. We'll just take uh, Ellie and Erica next, if that's OK. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, my name's Ellie. I represent an organisation called Square Peg. We work in the area of representing marginalised family voice, children who are unable to attend access or remain in education. But my interest came through personal experience as a mum, as a primary carer, um, and that led to a real awakening in terms of structural inequalities, um, institutional harm, that sort of thing. Um, and my children have grown up with a real distrust of services that I had been fortunate never to have acquired. I think one of the concerns I have really is that um, we see the greatest impact on parent carers um, in uh, whose children have additional needs, but also that they are uh, women as mothers, as registered um, in, in school records, are more likely to be fined and prosecuted for their child's non-attendance when they're trying to advocate for it. So my question is, um, what are the steps towards addressing that? Um, because um, it's it's a massive, massive problem for families, and it often uh, disables and um, and uh, and disempowers them, I suppose, within a patriarchal system that tends to blame the parents um, and parenting. Um, but also in terms of participatory politics, which is what I'm most passionate about and most keen. And I feel like I found my spiritual political home with the Cooperative Party. I'm so excited with everything that it represents. And um, I'm working closely with the co-op group as well, multi Academy Trusts. Um, so the opportunity I think is really clear here, but um, how do we ensure that we are authentically listening to people who would like to be involved, and particularly as the previous question highlighted, the real desire to ensure that the solutions are built with the marginalised voices who have the direct experiences of being failed or, or excluded. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Ali. Erica, are you still here? I yeah. You asked up earlier. No. Um, thank you, uh, Annalise, um, and for the event. Um, to the co -op. thank you to the co -op for the event. I want to echo Ivan's uh, points as he started. When I got my autism diagnosis, I was essentially told, "Congratulations, you're autistic." Bye. Um, there is no adult um, uh, post-diagnosis uh, autism pathway in Lancashire at all, um, and so you essentially get your diagnosis and you're on your own. Um, which was not good because I was, as many adults are, um, diagnosed because I was in a time of crisis, um, uh, at, which actually does lead on to my point. So um, uh, next week, uh, Lancashire County Council will, will Lancashire County Council's cabinet will consider its integration strategy. It's all fine and good. It's not actually a bad strategy, which is very generous of me to say. But um, it relies entirely on integration, uh, on mainstreaming. Um, so, you know, that highways will mainstream it, that, um, you know, that all of the areas of the county council will pay attention to, you know, gender, uh, race, disability, you know, that they will, and 
frankly, I think we are pretty clear that we don't actually believe there are any gender or equality specialists in the highway, uh, highways team. Um, and um, I have an ongoing concern that as we talk about devolution, uh, and Lancashire is on a devolution pathway, that if we pass policy and program responsibilities, that there is no significant um, policy or analysis machinery for gender inequalities work in councils. And my concern is, is that because they don't have it, they won't think that they need to build it unless somebody is kind of actively agitating and on the right side of the politics um, as, as, as those things progress. So I think we've been lucky with kind of where we have women metro mayors. I think a number of them have very specifically focused on, on you know, women's safety and we spoke about that earlier. But I think particularly where we have some conservative councils leading that devolution process, that unless we are very explicit that they need to be putting uh, gender and equalities issues at the fore, like embedding that in the in the policy and program machinery that they build for much bigger responsibilities, that it won't be there. Um, and so I'd really like to see that flagged in the devolution white paper when it comes up and for it to be part of the thinking that we are taking forward, both in terms of how we ensure those groups are involved in discussions about devolution, but how we ensure that the bodies that come out of those discussions have the capacity to do that. Oh, thank you. Some big, big topics there. Uh, Annalise, may I be able to hand over back to yourself to, to try and address some of those? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you ever so much, everyone. Um, really important questions. So uh, maybe just to try and take them in order. Ivan, um, first of all, I think it's really important that we're um, uh, you know, very celebratory, actually, of uh, autistic people in positions of leadership. I'm absolutely delighted that we have what I think is the first national uh, ever um, autistic mayor in Oxford. I'm extremely proud of him. He happens to be a, a good friend of mine, uh, Councillor Mike Riley. Um, he, when he was inaugurated, he was really determined to inform everyone of the fact that he um, is autistic. He's a, um, someone who has um, always sought to be very open about that. Um, and I think that is important, actually, uh, that we can see those examples and and uh, kind of role models, actually, um, uh, just as with, with every other group of people, I do think that's important. Um, I then also think, and I suppose relating this a little bit to Ellie's point, um, I think it really is important that we do make sure that services are improved in these areas. Um, I'll come on to children's services in a, in a moment and Ellie's questions, but um, Ivan, when it comes to uh, uh, kind of people who are you know adults um, and I guess Erica has kind of touched on this as well um, I think there is quite a lot of variability uh, you know it's, it's really interesting actually um, the way that Erica spoke about this when she said that she'd um, uh, received a diagnosis and then it was kind of like a bit of paper then that was it um, it's quite variable across the country so in some other places there is kind of signposting to um, you know, different forms of support and discussion groups, all that kind of thing. Um, so I think that it is important that we're considering, well, how can we do this better as a society? And I know that um, Stephen Timms, our Minister for Disabled People, uh, would be you know, really interested in looking at this. Um, what he's also determined to do, and this kind of relates to all three questions, is to drive forward on that manifesto commitment to put disabled people at the heart of all that we do and um, you know I would also say autistic uh, people as well we need to make sure that um, our society's diversity is reflected in everything that we do so he's kind of working really hard on making sure that he's having that interaction with um, different representative groups 
of course, there's always a bit of a challenge because sometimes, uh, you know, some of the big organisations, you know, people say, well, do they reflect the grassroots? But, you know, I know he's aware of that. He's trying to make sure he's having that conversation right across the board to really understand what people's genuine concerns are, but also where the opportunities are as well. And I thought, um, you know, Ivan's point in the way that he put it was very powerful there. We need to recognise the opportunities here and try and drive them forward together. Um, I suppose relating that to the points that Ellie made, um, I think, uh, Ellie, the, the kind of pattern that you described is quite similar to um, what I've discussed with a number of parents in my own constituency. So it being you know, very difficult to access the kind of support that is needed for children um, uh, with special educational needs and disabilities within um, mainstream provision. Um, in fact, there's been quite a lot of contestation about that in the area that I'm speaking to you from. So Oxfordshire, um, Bridget Phillipson, as our Secretary of State for Education and for Children, she is really determined to be improving this. There was an uplift, as I understand it, in the funding side, you know, recognising that budgets are under far too much pressure when it comes to this provision. Um, we need to really be taking a, a very thorough look at this because the system is just not working at the moment and Bridget has been very clear uh, about that we really need to recognise that families are not getting the support that they need um, that children need to have uh, that support and that it's important for all of us right across society that we deliver this better so um, thank you so much Ellie for raising that so powerfully and Erica your points about um, devolution I thought were really interesting and I will seek to uh, feed that in uh, to um, the communities department uh, that there needs to be that kind of an approach there. I know that right across government we're taking um, uh, equality impact um, far more seriously than uh, you know the previous governments have done. That will not be a surprise. So I know that this will be an element of uh, the um, examination of what, what we need to do uh, into the future. But thank you for raising it. I do think it's really important and actually um, I thought you you hit the nail on the head with some of the way that you described this, Erica, that um, quite often, you know, I will see a claim that, uh, you know, women's equality, for example, will be mainstreamed right across the board. Um, and I'm not going to go into details about any one authority uh, because obviously I don't know any of the background, so I'm not going to do that. But, you know, quite often you would see that kind of a claim. And then I will ask, well, what will happen differently because of that commitment to mainstream women's equality. And I don't often get a, a complete response back, right? So if this is gonna be meaningful, if it really is gonna be mainstreamed, then we need to be clear about what will change as a result of having that policy approach. Um, so, you know, I think really making sure that there's a kind of explicit focus on this is very important and ultimately and sorry i feel like i've, I've gone on a bit I'll, I'll speed up ellie ultimately i think this is this is actually about the quality of services again for everyone if you have services that are not going to be delivering for the needs of different areas and everyone who lives in those areas then they're not going to be as effective as they need to be so we do need to be getting better at all of this and we're determined to do so with the new labor and in my case cooperative government Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll, I'll go to next, because I think a couple of them we could uh, group together. So there's one which is, can you say a little bit more about the social and economic duty in councils and how this can impact equalities in local areas? And then relatedly, um, what incentives do you recommend councils put in place to encourage cooperative models Bearing in mind, we are all struggling for money. Um, I definitely feel acknowledge that as a councillor. And then um, the, the final question on a slightly different topic. Um, it says there is a lack of confidence in the DWP. Many in the disabled community think that it would be the wrong place for us to have what is essentially our only representation for our community other than yourself. There are several departments that, in, that need to be involved to enable us to get back into work. Are there any plans for a disabilities minister? Brilliant. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so maybe to start with the first question, 
first LA on um, the socioeconomic duty. So this uh, is a part of the 2010 Equality Act um, that was not enacted by Conservative government. So there, there were there are a few different provisions that they decided not to switch on. Uh, perhaps not a surprise. Um, it was obviously Labour legislation that was then left to uh, the Conservatives to enact. Um, now you have seen the Scottish government, the Welsh government, and as I mentioned, a number of councils adopting that socio excuse me socioeconomic duty. Now they've done it in quite different ways. So. Uh, essentially, what that duty requires is um, when there are major decisions um, that the impact on socio-economic inequality will be considered. Now, the case that is often mentioned as a kind of exemplar of this by the Scottish government was when they were looking at the impact of the um, assessment approach after COVID and uh, they adopted a particular um, a set of procedures around that, which was related to the fact that they knew there was kind of inequality within the education system. Um, so they adopted a, a different approach to the, to the, well, certainly than to England, because they said they had looked at this through a socioeconomic lens from the beginning. Um, for some of the councils that have enacted it, places like Bradford, for example, my understanding is that they've sought to try and make sure that um, the voices of everyone are kind of involved in major decisions, so including the voices of uh, people living in poverty, for example, that that is considered the impact of different decisions uh, on those people as well. Now, what we're really determined to do is to make sure that this is enacted in a way that is effective, but they're also, and related to what, what you just said, Ellie, that is actually deliverable, that, um, you know, is, is something that's not going to be a kind of tick box burden, but that's actually going to be supporting councils in doing, you know, what, what they want to do, which is, as I said before, deliver effective services for people who live in their area. So um, that's what we're kind of focused on really uh, at the moment. Um, the points about uh, disabled people, thank you so much for the question on that. So um, Stephen Tim's uh, yes, it's based in the Department for Work and Pensions, but he is the Minister for Disabled People and he is doing a brilliant job, I have to say. He really is. Um, and not just on issues related to uh, the Department of Work and Pensions. So, um, for example, I've worked with him on uh, British Sign Language, um, making sure, you know, policies and practices around that are appropriate. Um, he went to support the Paralympics. He's been supporting disabled people's sport. Um, we've been working on other issues like accessibility uh, as well of businesses and that kind of thing for mobility impaired and um, sight, uh, sight impaired people as well. So um, he is focusing right across the board. So not just within the Department of Work and Pensions, but actually, you know, cutting right across uh, government. And I'm obviously working with him on that. We have um, commitments for change uh, that would be uh, not only applying in, in work and pensions, but more broadly. So, for example, we're committed to introducing disability pay gap reporting, as with ethnicity pay gap reporting. Um, and that would be obviously something that would potentially have a really big impact on larger companies, those with 250 employees or more, um, so that they could actually see, well, OK, they might be all right at recruiting disabled people, but there could be blockages as you go through an organisation and it can be a really effective uh, lever for helping businesses to to drive that change internally to understand okay right there's clearly a blockage this is where we need to be uh, putting some management attention and Elliot I'm really embarrassed because what was the middle question again can you remind me there were two related to local councils one was a more general one about how can we incentivize councils to adopt more cooperative policies I remember now brilliant yes an excellent question so um it's really interesting because I think you see now such a strong push towards cooperative values across a whole variety of councils. Now, I think that's partly because of the work that the Cooperative Party has done, because now, as I understand it, there are more than a thousand 
cooperative representatives, including lots and lots of cooperative councils. It's probably much more than that, actually, and I've underestimated it. But, you know, that, that has been because of that hard work. So you have now many individuals who um, will be carrying that with them because of their party affiliation. Um, but I think also, and I, I remember now the question was linked to, well, how can this be achieved in constrained financial circumstances? I think quite often those models will be the ones that will be the most cost effective or the kind of work that's been undertaken um, using cooperative principles can really deliver value. So you know, I'm thinking here of my own uh, council in Oxford, um, which is the Labour Council, um, and has been really determined to focus on local value, the kinds of um, uh, you know, work that's gone, gone on within the cooperative party around making sure that uh, the kind of purchasing power of the council is used um, to deliver kind of longer term economic sustainability. Um, in Oxford's case, it's been particularly around workforce uh, because that's one of the biggest challenges that we have. We have a, a really tight labour market. So um, the city council's really focused on thinking, well, how can we be supporting people, you know, for example, uh, people who might have been in prison. Uh, we work with a big social enterprise, um, which which helps those individuals or people who may have been rough sleeping, that kind of thing, trying to have an integrated approach. And I think that is really using those cooperative values, you know, whether they're described as such or whether they're just implicit. So I don't think it's an either or, I guess what I'm saying is, I think this can be actually fundamental to delivering really good quality services and embedding that value in local areas. Um, but when you have cooperative councillors, obviously that helps to drive that agenda forward really explicitly. Fantastic and great to hear that the government is taking a holistic approach to, to kind of supporting disabled people across, across all policy and not just within, within DWP. So I think we've got two questions or two hands raised. So I'll take those two questions and then a question from the chat because I think we've got time for just just one more round of questions. So Kindy, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for your um, presentation and coming to the conference today, uh, Minister. Um, I missed some of it, I have to admit. I was traveling from Coventry <laughs> to my in-laws in, in Cambridge. Um, I guess my question is really something that I'm not really clear about how we can uh, tackle together both Labour and Cooperative Party. We had the riots in the summer, and I guess with the um, you know criminal uh, court justice that's going through, and, and I think for some people that they may feel that it's now ended. But for some of us who have to walk the streets, etc., we we you know go to shops, etc. We still have that fear um, that is with us. So, in terms of the kind of narrative and and I guess what's happening in what's happened with the recent elections in the states and their approach to migration, how do you think? we can really work together, both Labour and Cooperative Party, that kind of changes the narrative a bit. So, for example, if we look at community wealth building, you know, asylum seekers and migrants have a lot to offer. Um, and, and I just wondered what, what your thoughts were really on that. And I don't think it's a subject that we really um, talk about much in the cooperative movement. Oh, thank you, Kindy. Um, David, would you like to, to pose your question? Yeah. Um... Good morning, Minister. Thank you for being there. My question is really around the deaf and hard, hard of hearing community. Now, I have to wear two hearing aids. And since the last government, um, I believe, stopped GPs from doing... Uh, earwax removal because if you're wearing hearing aids you are susceptible to more earwax the private sector have took it over and they're charging between 50 and 60 pound to remove earwax each ear so do you think we're streeting? Could do something about that? Oh, thank you, David. And I'll just take the last question from the chat because I know we're 
fast running out of time. Um, and the final question will be, what assurances can you give that the protections and entitlement for disabled children and disabled parents within the Equality Act and Children and Families Acts will not be diluted under SEND reforms? Thank you. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, everyone, um, for really important questions. And first of all, um, Kindy, no one should ever feel fear if they're just going to the shops, walking down the street. That should never be accepted in our country. And certainly we're determined to ensure that there's never, ever an acceptance uh, that that could ever be right or even um, anticipated by people. Um, the riots that you referred to, Kindy, it's really clear what they were. They were the actions of criminals. And that's why the government moved really quickly to make sure that those individuals were prosecuted, that they felt the full force of the law and that we were really clear what they were about. They were about criminality. We we're talking about thugs and I'm personally very pleased indeed that there was that speedy action to get that message out there. Um, and I think actually the kind of values that you alluded to, Kendi, we, we did see, I think, in the aftermath, actually, of the riots, the fact that, you know, in many different communities, people immediately came together. They felt like they wanted to be visible together, helping with the clear up people from all different backgrounds, supporting each other and being very explicit that actually our country is one that is built around tolerance, around supporting each other, that we're not a divided country, that we need to be working together. I thought that was, you know, really clear in the response. So um, I think community wealth be building absolutely uh, is important. Um, and I think making sure that we can kind of really intensify some of what, quite frankly, uh, you know, the previous Conservative governments were just simply not engaged in the kinds of um, not just community wealth building, but community building activities, you know, interfaith initiatives, um, making sure that we're bringing together people from different backgrounds. I think it's more important, really, than ever that we support that. And obviously that is in line with cooperative values as well as labour ones. And um, David, on your question, um, I am well aware of this. And, you know, I think that um, uh, situation that you described is leading to um, some, you know, really quite uh, difficult situations for people. Um, I was actually speaking with um, someone who works in that area in the private sector, as you mentioned, David, who goes to um, care homes. And she said to me that actually she's coming across older people who have been believed to have been starting to suffer from dementia. And actually, it's not that they're suffering from dementia. They can't hear properly because their ears are blocked. So clearly, we've got to get better at this as a society. And I'll certainly pass on uh, to West Street and your concerns about um, this and in, in particular, whether the cost could be being a barrier for people who uh, need those services. I, do, I don't know whether this is an area where there might be variability across different parts of the country um, for those in need who would not be able to pay that fee, but I will raise it in any case um, uh, with where streeting. And then the last question about disabled people's uh, rights under legislation, whether that be um, parents uh, of disabled children or disabled children themselves. Um, absolutely, Labour is determined to make sure that we uh, uphold um, those rights. It's really important for us. I mean, Labour is the party of, of course, the Equality Act. Um, as I said, we, we weren't able to uh, necessarily enact it because we um, uh, lost that 2010 election, but we really are determined to be moving forward on this and recognising, of course, that there are very, very large numbers of disabled people, but far too often they're just not represented um, either in politics or indeed in our media um, uh, or other organisations either. So we're really determined to keep pushing forward on this agenda. I know that Stephen uh, really is himself as well, Stephen Timms. Great. Oh, thank you so much. And I think, you know, we unfortunately always have way too many questions and that the time allows for, and I think we are going to have to bring our our Q&A to a close now, but I'm sure we'll get to continue this dialogue with our first ever Cooperative Equalities Minister going forward. So 
Thank you so, so much for joining us, Annalise. I know you've got a, a busy Saturday ahead of you at uh, your daughter's football tournament. So we'll we'll let you get back and back and enjoy that. Um, but I believe I'm now going to be handing back to, to Jen, where we're going to be speaking about diversity within local government. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ellie, and thank you, Annalise. Um, it's been a, a very good start. Um, I'll just take a moment and say, um, my name is Jennifer Hemingway. I am the Equalities Officer for the Cooperative Party, and I am going to be chairing this session on diversity in local government. We have three councillors. I will also say that I am also a councillor in uh, the Metropolitan Borough of Sandwell, and I am going to be welcoming uh, three councillors to tell us a bit more about their own experiences. And then I believe we will have time for a very, very brief uh, Q&A afterwards. Um, so I think I will uh, begin by introducing uh, Councillor Valerie Boseman Kwashi. So she is a councillor in Islington and I will go ahead and let her tell us a bit about herself. So welcome, Valerie. Thank, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Councillor. Um, and welcome everyone on this call and thanks for attending. And it's really um, great to be here this morning to talk to you about um, diversity on the council in Islington. Um, as a born and bred Islingtonian, um, it's really important for me that the term diversity is not just a tick box. And I think joining the council um, in 2022 was one of our um, highest um, cohort of um, diverse and um, mixed in terms of um, the councillors that were elected. And um, we have um, more um, people with um, hidden and visible disabilities. We have more um, black and brown and other minority ethnic um, communities represented um, on the council. And we have um, our amazing leader who's now going off to City Hall, um, who's of mixed heritage as well. Um, going back to the, the the point of um diverse councils and why it's important i think when i thought that when we claim when we declared the declaration um in 2023 um last year what was really good for for me was knowing that we already more or less had it but um going back now um for the story the timeline um we introduced let's talk islington in um 2021 of december and what we did was we went around and spoke well i didn't go around um, but council officers went around and spoke to various people within the, um, the community to ask them about their experiences in islington what we wanted to do was make sure that the inequality that we saw especially within poverty and um, was tackled and we saw post COVID-19, obviously, um, how um, the cost of living crisis um, was exacerbated because within Islington, we have the tale of two tales where we have people that have a lot of money and those that don't have. Um, the idea was to start to talk about how locals could access services and how we could um, make it a little bit more easy for them to approach the council. So whether that be online, or whether that be offline, We've introduced um, post then um, some community champions. We have um, an amazing array um, of parent champions. They go around and um, they support parents to access our services, which is um, Bright Starts, which allows um, parents um, from all backgrounds to access um, services to help them with their children, young people, whether they're in school education or not, um, to tackle um, their inequality where they feel that often they um, are not able able to um, get the support that they, that they need, whether it be um, about housing or accessing, um, you know, um, free school um, uniform and other various um, services. The approach um, that we had taken is a cooperative approach. And it's really nice because obviously being a majority um, Labour strong, um, that very together approach is about how local communities live, work and play within the borough and how they thrive and how they access services, but also improve their well-being. We know that at the moment, um, you know, post COVID-19 and um, the cost of living crisis, quite a lot of our elderly people um, feel that they often can't um, um, get involved and engaged in some of the stuff that we have, so activities. So we have, um, again, different 
ways that they can access services through our voluntary sector. And I think just like any other council, um, we have a really strong um, community um, access um, within the voluntary sector, which I think often is at full capacity, but um, they build really good relationships within the borough. Um, one thing that we also do, which I think is really important to talk about, is how um, we not just took in, um, in during 2023 um, that um, declaration of um, having um, a diverse council and making sure that people could access programmes where um, they could learn more about the council. But this year we also launched um, How to Become a Counsellor and um, many um, attended and found out more about that process. Um, we're not um, here um, to, you know, I say sometimes to just keep the seat warm, but to actually get other people involved and, and tackle the inequality that we all um, need to see and to see people um, getting involved within politics. Um, just want to end, though, um, in explaining um, a little bit more about our 2030 um, approach which is to make sure that by the end, and this it will be irrespective of, um, I guess, um, having a Labour or cooperative um, led council, I think it's really important because we have to have that kind of cross-party collaboration, which we had during our um, council um, programme. But I think what we're trying to do is um, ensure that we tackle the inequality by um, allowing people locally to know where to access information. We are also um, going to make sure that not only is our lo uh, local economy accessible for people that want to, for example, start startups, we want to make sure that they get involved in what happens in their communities. We want to make sure that children are a part of that conversation and young people. So we're doing a lot of um, engagement with them as well through our various services. We're also making sure that elderly people have their voice heard and people with uh, visible, and dis um, visible and invisible disabilities and making them feel bolder to um, take up initiatives and um, that they may want to get involved in and having the borough have more accessible um, play spaces, walking spaces, which you can all find online. But we're investing quite a lot in our local um, community so that our borough is a more um, inclusive um, borough. Um, we are also ensuring that um, not only are we doing that, we're going to have a greener and healthier and safer Islington, which um, en enables people to feel safe in the borough and to access um, services, whether that be the local community police um, or, um, you know, their local um, NHS services. So we've got lots happening in Islington that is making us more um, diverse and inclusive and having proportional representation. And um, just the last add in is that um, I'm really proud that we won our general election here in 2024. And I think Parliament is um, now actually more diverse in terms of LGBTQ plus brothers and sisters being on the um, ministerial um, role and also seeing across you know, different councils how they're working in improving also that representation. Because I think that's really important not just to have it as a tick box, but actually something that we actually see, because if you, you don't see it, um, you can't be it. Thank you. Apologies, I forgot to unmute myself. Uh, thank you very much, Valerie. And it's um, Valerie also uh, was uh, instrumental in passing our Diverse Councils Declaration from the Cooperative Party, as she referenced, which is a, a, a piece of work that we're really quite proud of. And I'm now going to move to uh, one of our um, councillors joining us from Wales, which is actually where we took the uh, idea for our Diverse Councils Declaration was from the Welsh LGA. And Lilith Fenris is joining us and I'm going to apologise now to her and all of my Welsh colleagues for my appalling pronunciation, but I'll do my best from Planelli. Did I get it right, Council? I, um, I'm sure Lilith will say it far better than I can. If you can tell us a bit more about your own journey into politics and how uh, diversity on the council works in your council. Welcome, Lilith. 
Hello and good morning, everybody. I'm sorry if I sound a bit croaky. I'm recovering from the flu. Um, my name is Councillor Lilith Fenris. I'm a councillor for a large seaside town in South Wales called Llyn And in 2022, at the age of 24, I was elected as our town's first openly transgender woman for any form of political position in its history. And within the next two years, I will be lucky enough to serve as our town's youngest and first transgender mayor. Yeah. When I was elected, it brought the age range of our council down by approximately 20 years. Um, this really stood out to me when I was meeting people in the community, as I came to understand just how deeply entrenched the idea of what a councillor traditionally looks like and how that continues to affect local governments in our area. The idea of local government being a remote task undertaken by men of retirement age creates a self-sustaining echo chamber that makes our communities distrusting and uneducated about what local government is, creating crossfire and confusion around the services we are responsible for and disinterest or disengagement for the projects we introduce for our communities. It's important for equality to be at the centre of building strong local councils, and not just for the communities and their priorities to be represented but for individuals from those communities to be able to see themselves in local government and in politics. I've always been very political all my life. However, when I came out as transgender, I put aside the idea of being active or putting myself forward, happy to donate money, but afraid that my face just wouldn't fit in. One day I had a knock on my door. The previous council for my ward was leafleting and recruiting ahead of the coming elections. And as I stood in my doorway, dressed in my pyjamas, trying to hold a conversation while stopping my dog from bolting for freedom, they asked me, have you considered standing for council? And like a stroke of lightning, it hit me that somebody else, somebody serious, could see my face fitting. Now, that, that I could do it, even, uh, even if I thought that I couldn't. Now, when I campaigned, people would tell me that they never vote in local elections or small elections, as they kept on referring to it, to my, my chagrin. But they would this time, and it's because that somebody looked like them and they were the candidate. But thankfully, and to my surprise, there was very little blatant transphobia throughout my campaign and time in office. That being yeah. said, though, it does exist, and there has been misogyny, ageism and homophobia too. It's rarely blatant and often not noticed by others that it doesn't affect, but it is there. Over the last few years, despite being a melting pot of cultures and communities and very welcoming, we have been on the front lines of culture wars. With the Stradley Park Hotel Asylum Seeker protest being hijacked by far-right organizations and putting our, uh, our large town into the spotlight in a very um, unflattering way. We have seen why now more than ever, it's important to check in on those communities <clears throat> not just that we belong to, but of those of characteristics and demographics that we don't belong to as well. I've seen it time and time again, frustrated and angry people that don't understand or have built preconceived ideas around why or what their local government is doing, and more often than not confusing different councils interchangeably as responsible. We have had threats of violence against councillors and suggestions of storming council chambers while we're in council. Thankfully, these were just boasts from keyboard warriors. However, it highlights the importance and responsibility that we have in making sure that our councillors reflect the diversity from our communities, not only to ensure the safety of these communities, but to help demystify the Byzantine bureaucracy that local councils are perceived to be. I've received a lot of support uh, from some very lovely colleagues, both fellow councillors, party members, and especially our MP. I'll be honest, being a councillor is hard work, it's challenging and more often than not it can be very tedious with very little lot of recognition mm -hmm. but it's worth it to see the faces of kids playing football at the stadium when we run our football festival or when we hold the family fun days that allow families hit by the cost of living crisis to come and do something fun and forget about it for a few hours without having to worry about paying for anything and it's in the quiet moments too the look of relief on somebody's face when they've told you the problem that they spend all week panicking over is something that you can help them with. I would encourage members and elected leaders first. <clears throat> Firstly, if there is somebody that you think would make a great candidate and would represent an end underrepresented area of diversity within your community, talk to them, but not just talk at them. Sometimes, like in my case, it just takes somebody saying it out loud so that you don't feel silly. More often than not, though, it's deeper rooted systematic and logistical issues. 
Things like daytime meetings or building accessibility and travel costs can be easily overlooked as inconveniences, but can be deeply restricting to others and in ways that you don't think about. Secondly, it can be intimidating coming into an environment like a council. Not everybody will feel comfortable claiming their space, especially in male dominated areas. Use your voice to support them and give them space to use their own voice, but don't speak for them and especially don't speak over them. And if you're listening to me and thinking, I want to do it, but I don't know where to start, I have some advice for you too. I used to suffer terribly from anxiety. And if you told me as a teenager that I'd be doing something like this today, they wouldn't believe you and then probably follow up with something quite sarcastic, if I'm honest. Mm -hmm. However, the first step is just putting yourself out there. It's uncomfortable and it's horrible. And usually you'll feel very embarrassed, but I promise you it will be okay and that you won't regret it. Try and understand what you're good at as well. No matter how obscure the skill is, once you understand what you do well and what you can improve upon, you can start building that network of members and volunteers so that you know what help to ask for and that you don't have to do it alone. And finally, but most importantly, is understand your impact. Like I said at the beginning, everybody and every community has an idea of what a counsellor should look like in their mind. Whether you're successful or not, the act of putting yourself forward will challenge people's preconceived notions of what a counsellor is. And that, in my experience, is how we begin building stronger, more diverse, more representative councils. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lilith. That's a very powerful story and thank you for sharing it with us. Um, I'm going to move next to our third panelist. Um, this is uh, Councillor Finley Gordon McCusker, who is joining us from Stoke-on-Trent City Council. Um, if you could tell us a bit about uh, your experience. Oh, and I, I should also say that Finley is also a cabinet member in Stoke and doing some phenomenal work in the Midlands. So welcome, Finley. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And uh, it's, it's great to be here. And it's great to have heard, uh, you know, so many inspiring contributions from other people. Um, so I'll kick off. I was I was asked by by Jen and the others to uh, talk briefly about my um, ha how I got into into activism and politics. And I suppose, really, I've always been um, quite a political person, um, but it was becoming very, very sick when I was about nine years old and, and the experience of my life being saved and transformed um, by the NHS, which really made me realise how lucky we were to have uh, this universal uh, free health service uh, for us all. And, and back then we had an NHS that worked. It was 2012, the cuts had just started to come through, um, but things still worked. You know, when you wanted to see the doctor, you could, and it was being able to see a doctor that saved me. Um, and, and you know, as, as, I, as I got older, I, as I say, I was nine then, um, I, I stayed engaged, I uh, watched the news and, and I was interested in what was going on around me. Um, and it was in the 2015 election, you know, because um, my parents aren't political, my family isn't political, um, so I was the old one out really. And um, my brother and I followed that election and we both wanted Labour to win. And, you know, we managed to convince our parents to vote Labour. Um, so we assumed that everyone was going to vote Labour. So when we didn't win, it was a real, real shock to me. Um, and, and I thought, oh gosh, this is, this is quite bad. What can I do? And I saw that one of my um, friend's parents had joined the Labour Party. So I decided to do the same. Um, and, you know, I got involved. I uh, made up my mind on who I wanted to be the leader and, and went and phone bank for that person. Um, and that was where I met my MP, who was incredibly um, supportive and, and welcomed me in. And I might have been um, somewhat of an oddity there, I guess, because I was 12 years old, um, small child, um, you know, with a, with a limp. Um, but but no one ever looked at me as, as though I was something strange. It was um, a very, very welcoming environment. And I'm really lucky and I think that's a, you know a big part of the reason that I am here today in, in this capacity. Um, similar to what Lilith said, um, you know it, it was being told by someone serious, someone with a vast uh, amount of experience uh, that made me realise that I could do do this. I'd never thought about going into local government. I'd always campaigned. I'd campaigned in general elections, local elections and even European elections when we had them and the referendum. Uh, but I didn't really know what the local council did. I didn't take much notice and much interest. Uh, our 
we, we didn't control the council when I when I got involved. Uh, they were making poor decisions and the Labour group wasn't particularly active. It was more like a, a you know, a debating club than, than anything else. Um, so it just wasn't something that I considered. But when when the new leader of, of, of our group, who's now leader of the council, fortunately, um, said asked me whether I'd ever considered it. And I said no. And she said that I really ought to. I kind of went away and thought, well, probably not. Um, and then she said it again. And I thought, oh, right, maybe she's, uh, you know, vaguely serious about this. Um, and so we had the conversation and um, I got more involved in, in the Labour group and read up a lot on what local government does and, you know, decided to put myself forward to become a candidate. And I was really fortunate that at the time I became a candidate, I managed to convince three or four of my friends who uh, were of a similar age or of a similar age to me uh, to do the same thing. So uh, there was a nice little uh, cohort of us um, standing for the council in 2023 in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, really unfortunately, uh, both of my, uh, all three of my friends uh, ended up uh, not winning their seats, which was devastating. So I was I was the, uh, the only one of us that, that managed to get elected. Um, and it felt like quite a lonely place for that weekend. I'm sure that the councillors on here um, won't recognise this feeling. That weekend after the local elections, I kind of thought, what on earth have I done with my life? I've just given away the next four years, um, you know, to being a councillor. And I don't know why. I've got no one alongside me. I'm, I'm on my own. Um, but actually, I, I was made to feel incredibly welcome within the Labour group. Our Labour group, in all honesty, um, isn't overly diverse it's nowhere near diverse enough and we've got a lot of work to do to turn that around um but despite that that apparent lack of diversity i was never made to feel like an outsider i was always included and um about a week into be being a counselor um i was walking through uh, with with the leader and she said to me um you'll be a cabinet support member won't you and i said I've no idea what that is so it's, it's, it's a day a week you don't have to do a lot just uh just go and be with Amjid the cabinet member um and uh, you know I agree and um wow it was a, it was a real experience it wasn't what I expected it wasn't a day a week as, as she promised she got me there um and for the first time I was sat um at, at a table making decisions big decisions about the future of our city um investment infrastructure um and service delivery it was it was quite quite overwhelming really um but through those conversations with the leader and, and, and with colleagues uh, in the cabinet and outside the cabinet, you know, I realised I might feel that this is a really uh, big challenge and possibly too much of a challenge. I've bitten off more than I could chew. Um, but I was encouraged that people thought that I did a good job and that, that I could do this. And so uh, when in, in May, uh, the leader asked me uh, whether I'd like to become a cabinet member, I, I did initially say no, um, but, but she was quite adamant. And, uh, and here I am now, um, you know, cabinet member, uh, I, I cover the transport infrastructure and regeneration portfolio, which is great fun. Um, and actually it gives me great pride as the youngest councillor um, in Stoke-on-Trent. And I'm told the youngest cabinet member ever uh, to be responsible for the, uh, huge challenge uh, and task of, of regenerating some areas of Stoke-on-Trent, which have been derelict since before I was born, it is quite um, inspiring. It gives me a reason to get up and, and, and work every day um, for the betterment of our community. I guess in terms of diversity, I, I think that this uh, conference and this panel is in, uh, are both incredibly important um, because these are things that can often be overlooked. We can talk about it, you know, at the end of a group meeting, but it's never normally an agenda item. Um, and we can kind of have a conversation with friends about the need to make councils and, and, and politics in general um, and society more diverse. Um, but not a lot gets done. And so it's really, really good that, you know, this is something that we believe in as cooperators. And I'm really grateful that, that this... Um, this forum has been set up to, to provide space for these important conversations. Um, one of the things I was really interested in, I was talking to a colleague uh, from, from Walsall Council, who um, th they're having their first uh, women's conference for Walsall uh, to encourage more women in, in, in that area to become councillors. I think that's really important as well. I know our Labour group, like many, um, is not gender balanced. And actually, I do believe that we get better decisions when people are better represented. Um, I know that there are things that I've done differently um, and that I've had to argue for um, with my colleagues who didn't see it through my perspective as a younger person. Um, 
things that I've had to argue for as a disabled person. Um, like uh, we, we're spending an awful lot of money investing uh, in upgrading all of our bus stops because a lot of them aren't accessible. And, you know, if you're not disabled and you don't have a pram and you've never used a wheelchair, it doesn't seem like a barrier at all. But it's about having those that really wide and diverse uh, set of voices around the table. And I do believe that, that by doing that and by encouraging other people um, to step up and, and fill those positions that we'll get much better government both locally and nationally. And uh, I'll shut up now because I've had enough of hearing my voice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Finn. I have to say, I quite like hearing your voice and quite like hearing what you have to say. It's a wonderful contribution. Um, we have a little bit of time for questions, so I am going to uh, open it up and I will actually begin with uh, some that I have already received in the chat. Um, so uh, first question that I have for the group is, in the cost of living crisis, there is a risk that this agenda will be less of a priority in councils. Can you describe any practical low cost ways that councils could remove barriers and encourage more diverse candidates to feel empowered to stand? And I think the next question I have, I'll take them in a couple at a time, is uh, related. Um, it's uh, someone who is saying that uh, their own personal experience that this year I was unable to stand as a county councillor due to my disabilities and the inaccessibility of our public transport system in a rural community. I would ask whether everyone with or without a disability would be able to take part in, by enabling remote attendance and proxy voting at local authority meetings. There is a consultation on this out right now, and I think this would massively enrich our pool of councillors. And this uh, question that they have is, how do you think that this will improve and your thoughts on the consultation that is currently out? And final question. Do you think the recent announcement that the councillors' addresses will no longer be published online will help encourage people who may be worried about the safety of being a councillor to take the plunge? So um, I will open it up and I will go first in the order that we you spoke. Um, so I'll ask uh, Valerie, you would like to address um, those questions for us? Yeah, and I'll try and be brief. Um, I think in terms of tackling um, inequality when you want to stand. I, I know that through my own um, experience, I got a lot of support from the cooperative party. So whether that was money towards um, the materials and also putting myself um, out of my comfort zone, actually disclosing that I had hidden disabilities. I think it, that is the plunge right there in itself, that you have to be a bit open and honest and trust that when you do disclose these things, it's not going to be obviously aired out, you know, as some sort of um, gossip kind of thing. But you have to just really trust. And I know it, it sounds a bit naive, but I, I've really found that in doing so, it's been able to um, help me to be a better counsellor. Um, in terms of safety, I think um, I've written loads of um, articles and vlogs about um, the importance, especially of women and young girls, and having that um, diversity in the council that we should actually be able to take self-defense self -defense classes. Doesn't mean you wanna go there and um, you know cause any beef, but it's just nice to know that you're equipped to know what to do when you know things occur. And I think through that process, what we've done at our council is that we've had a lot of training where it's been very specific about even when we're door knocking. I don't think as um, Labour and Cooperative, we often think about, you know, the safety of our, our members when we go out on the doorstep, whether it's, you know, three minutes, someone's gone, you know, walkies, you need to go back and call them back. Or if someone steps in to take a picture of some sort of like damp or mould, in, in my case, where someone's, you know, sort of hanged back. Um, also, staggering when you canvas you know having a a smaller group that can't keep up with the the fast you know um uh door knockers um so to speak in terms of the consultation i think we've done something similarly where we've looked at you know the pool of candidates that we have um coming through and we also put things in place where they have buddies and um people that shad they shadow so that it doesn't make it feel like um it's something that you can't do and i think having that shadowing and that coaching as well as mentoring which are three different things actually does help candidates so um just be brave and and be trusting and in the process and just be yourself thank you 
Thank you, Valerie. Um, I will come to you next, Lilith. Hi. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of taking the questions one at a time, um, a low-cost method to try and make sure that you are increasing the diversity of your, your candidate um, bench, I, I think, first of all, the, the easiest thing to do is just to make sure if you are a counsellor going out into these communities that might feel a little bit unusual that you're inserting yourself into, but going out and speaking to people, letting people know what a counsellor is, what it does, don't do what was done when I first became a counsellor and just say, yeah, don't worry about it. You can do as much or as little as you want. Be very honest with the expectations there. Um, and I think realistically that that is the best way to boost engagement, obviously, for my area. We're not a large metropolitan area. We are a, a large town, but it's, it's a little bit different in terms of makeup of what you might experience as challenges in, in larger metropolitan areas. But I don't think there's any option really that that beats just going out there and speaking to people and letting them know what it is that you do what the role is um entails and then just to see if that is something that they can contribute to or complete in terms of the other two questions um it's actually something that we're already doing in our council we do fully hybrid meetings and this is because we do have um members in our council that do have disabilities that wouldn't be able to attend council regularly um, and as a result, we have fully hybrid meetings and I would um, encourage that when it comes to things like consultations and seeing how this works, look over across the border to us in Wales because we're doing a lot of these things already and it's absolutely fantastic. It allows people to be very engaged um, and not just necessarily for um, the people that you think it would affect as well, um, because obviously there's it's not just people with disabilities or hidden disabilities. But one of the demographics that's actually underrepresented almost criminally across councils across the land is having councillors that are um, young mothers and having things like hybrid meetings allows women that wouldn't necessarily have the time to get ready, come to a council, be briefed, go through that. They would also have that ability going through it as um, as a hybrid meeting as well. And sorry, could you just remind me what was the, the final question there? Was it talking about removing the addresses as a step forward? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so again, this is also something that we've we've had in in my council. Obviously, for my myself, it was my own personal circumstances, um, but it is something that we have considered. Obviously, with the Shady Park Hotel situation, um, in my experience, it does give me that that confidence that. I'm still contactable about uh, by the community, but I live in a rough area of town. It's uh, got a reputation for itself and the idea of having people being able to email me or call me whenever they need to, but not showing up on my doorstep gives me that confidence to be able to go out there and engage with my community uh, more fully. So again, I, I would very much support that for councillors across, across the UK. Thank you very much, Liv. I'm, I'm ever so sorry, Finn. I'm going to have to um, uh, exclude you on this one. And I'm really, really sorry to do that because I would love to hear from you. But we've actually run over time on this session and we need to move on. So if you uh, had a question that did not get answered, do send it through and we'll try and get an answer back to you. And um, thank you very much for joining us, Valerie, Lilith and Finn. Um, it's been wonderful to hear from you. And I am now going to be handing across um, to my colleague, Ashley. Ashley is our NEC representative for the LGBT community. And Ashley will be introducing our next speaker. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jen. Um, as Jen said, I'm the LGBTQ plus rep on the NEC. Um, quick plug that we got our network elections coming up and it would be great to see as many LGBTQ plus people running as possible to get a great um, spread of candidates. So I'm really proud to introduce uh, Dr. Leanne Dawson, who is an equity, diversity and inclusion consultant, author and academic. Her inclusion work spans many fields and a broad range of organisations, including the film industry, charities, technologies and engineering companies, global brands, hospitality, educational establishment and the government. 
Uh, she develops workshops and talks, conducts culture reviews, creates uh, strategy and policy, advises on inclusive recruitment and creates resources such as e-learning, handbooks, podcasts, material and diversity and inclusion uh, qualifications. Also, she was the first chair of the Scottish Queer Film International Festival uh, and undertakes significant work to make the film and television industries more diverse and inclusive. As an academic, Leanne specialises in the representation and inclusion of those traditionally excluded from the arts. She has published a number of books, chapters and articles on this and other diversity matters. I guess the first question, Leanne, <laughs> Uh, is how do you find time for all this? <laughs> I have to try and make time. I'm also a mother. I have to try and make time. It works. It works. <laughs> I'm just going to start. Uh, thank you so much for that intro. I'm just going to share my screen now, uh, just so you can get my PowerPoint up there. Just one moment. Can you see that okay? That's can you brilliant. See that PowerPoint okay? Yeah, okay, grand. Thank you very much. So thanks so much for that intro um, and a warm welcome to this session on creating inclusive leadership. Um, also, I just want to thank you all for taking the time, especially on a weekend morning. We all have a lot of other things going on and I really appreciate you being here. So uh, I'm a middle-aged white woman. I have long brown hair, red lipstick. I'm in front of a white door and white wall for anyone who needs an image description. And for those reading captions, uh, my accent is from County Durham in North East England. So, inclusive leadership means ensuring people are treated equitably. And we'll get to this term in a moment. It also means they have a sense of belonging and that they feel valued. And it means that they're supported to achieve their potential. So in today's session, then we're gonna think about the ethical, the business and the legal cases for inclusion we'll have some tips for inclusive leadership. There's a practical tool, so how you can interject for a more positive outcome when there is an issue, as well as an exercise on considering our biases. I think this is important as well, because I'm aware that not everyone here might have a role with a leadership element. So the information and tools I'll give you are applicable far beyond that. It's about thinking about what you need from a leader and also to think about how you contribute towards creating an inclusive culture as well. So, on the slide, we have three images. You might have seen these already. They've circulated quite a bit on social media. And I'm going to describe the images for anyone who needs that. Just to note, all of the images in this presentation are purely decorative, so I won't be describing those. I'll describe this one. So in each cartoon image on the screen, there are three white people of different heights watching a baseball game. In the first image, they each have a box. So there's one box per person to stand on. However, despite each having a box, the shortest person still can't see the game over the apparently wooden fence. In the second image, the tallest person has given the shortest person their box, so the shortest person has two boxes to stand on, and all three can now see over the wooden fence. But in the third image, none of the people have a box to stand on, and none of them need one, because the wooden fence has been replaced with see-through railings. So in the first, we have equality, okay? In the first image, we have equality. With equality, everyone has the same opportunities. This term equality is so very important with regard to the law and the UK 2010 Equality Act, which we get to shortly. But as the image shows us, equality isn't, en isn't enough, sorry. Equality is never enough. It's not enough to give everyone the same thing when the starting point isn't equal and there are differences between people. In the second, we have equity. So equality in the first, equity in the second. This recognises, so equity recognises that each person has different circumstances and gives the correct resources to reach an equal outcome. Okay, so for equality, everybody gets the same thing. For equity, we know that everybody has different circumstances. We get the correct resources to reach an equal outcome. But in the third, we have inclusion. No one needs to ask for or be supplied with anything to be included. It's built in from the start. And this is what we're really aiming for. And of course, in addition to the see-through fence, there'd be things such as audio description, there'd be slide and scale and free tickets so that everybody could afford to go and so on and so forth. So inclusion 
always has to be holistic. Inclusion isn't just one thing. It's not about one person being able to see over the fence. It's about everybody having what they need to be included if they want to be, okay, to be included, to be welcome. So why then do we need to be inclusive? Why is it important to be inclusive? Well, an inclusive environment can help to create a safe work environment. This is really, really important. It's important to have a safe work environment. We can help to achieve this through psychological safety. And psychological safety means providing a space for vulnerability. This can range from people being themselves. So for example, you know, uh, a gay man would go into work on a Monday morning or go into an area on a Monday morning and know that they can talk about their weekend with their husband just as a straight woman could do. Okay, they're not going to fear being judged. They're not going to fear what people think. And this kind of, you know, firefighting and worrying about what people might think of you in the workplace or in various organisations causes a lot of problems, right? So it's best to get rid of that, to eliminate all of that. It's the ethical way to go about things. So it means that there's a space for vulnerability. People can be themselves. They can also voice their ideas without uh, feeling daft. So if somebody makes a contribution in a meeting, they won't be dismissed, they won't be laughed at. I always say there's no such thing as stupid questions. Always ask the question, that's fine, right? So they can voice their ideas without feeling daft. They can also, in a space of psychological safety, they can admit to a mistake without feeling fear. And what's really important with psychological safety is that it begins with leadership. So if the most senior person in the room can, for example, admit to a mistake at work, and if the senior leadership team or the, you know, the leaders can demonstrate that people are supported rather than told off or disciplined for making sort of a one-off mistake, a mistake here and there, then others should also feel safe to do so. Okay, for inclusive, uh, inclusive leadership, psychological safety really is key. We need the psychological safety. But of course, to be inclusive is also really good externally. So important internally that everybody who is a member of an organization or works in an organization feels safe, but also to be good, uh, to be inclusive externally means you can attract more members. You can get the best colleagues when the reputation of an organizational culture is good and it's healthy. And of course, all of this also leads to a business case. Okay, you'll have strong ideas, strong policies. If people feel that they can speak up and be included. Also, in other situations, you'll have better products, better policies, uh, sorry, better products, uh, better pr increased profits and so on. So it's always going to lead to strengths. OK, if you've got an inclusive environment, that is going to be stronger. And here we need to be aware of the term groupthink. OK, so groupthink sounds great. Group, everybody united, etc. No, groupthink is bad. What happens when we have groupthink is that people with similar characteristics, similar lived experiences, can make really similar de decisions. They're coming to things from the same place. They've had the same life experiences. They haven't had that diversity of experience, right? So if a group without diversity, where a group is pretty homogenous, most people are the same or very similar, similar lived experiences. If this group without diversity is creating a solution to a problem, it's not going to be as strong as when there's a diversity in a range of people, a range of people with different lived experiences, different characteristics, and they can speak up and say, hey, this would be a problem from perspective X, okay? If you only have perspective A and everybody has perspective A, what about A to Z, right? All of the other perspectives. So if somebody can speak up and say, hey, perspective X, this would be an issue, then we're trying to avoid this groupthink. Groupthink can also make people feel like they need to go along with the group. So if there's a dominant norm there, people are all saying, oh yes, this idea is fabulous, we'll go along with it. People can feel like they need to go along with it too. They don't voice concerns. They don't voice opinions. They don't voice other perspectives. The crowd is saying that I need to go along with it. Okay. It makes them feel that then they can't also point out any potential issues. And this is where psychological safety comes in. If they feel safe to speak up and not just agree with the crowd, team members will feel comfortable raising potential issues. Um, and they can raise potential issues at a stage when they can still be solved and resolved. And this is really crucial. If they're not psychologically safe, so if they don't feel comfortable speaking up and groupthink happens, then issues might only become apparent once an idea, a product, whatever is in the public domain and the backlash begins. And this is far too late. People need to feel comfortable to speak up from the outset. Likewise, with, with, with an issue, right? When I said about psychological safety, if somebody has made a mistake at work or in an organization, 
and they feel that they're going to be chastised for that, then they might try to not voice it. They might be scared to voice it. They might try to cover it up. If they made a mistake and they can say straight away, they can hold their hands up and say, oh, I've done this. There's an error here. What can we do to put it right? Then things don't snowball. They get resolved promptly and they get resolved fairly in a, in a space where people don't feel terrified of making these errors. A lot of research has been done on this by McKinsey and Company and also the Boston uh, Consultant Organization, the Boston Consultant Group, sorry, um, and other large uh, firms which deal with consultancy worldwide. One thing as well to note is when we want to avoid a group think, we should always remember that a culture ad is better than a culture fit. So various things when people are hiring or when they're, you know, wanting people to join a certain group, they'll say, yes, yes, we want a culture fit. No, a culture ad is always better than a culture fit. With a culture ad, you'll get more diversity in terms of people, in terms of thought, etc. So a culture ad really is a value add. So we're always thinking about this culture ad, oops, as a value add. Sorry, just scrolling down. Right, so there's also very much, so we talked about some of the business cases for inclusion. There's also very much a legal case for inclusion. You'll probably be very aware of this with the, the work that you do, right? So. The following characteristics under the UK 2010 Equality Act, the following characteristics are protected from discrimination. So we've got age, disability, gender reassignment, marriage or civil partnership, pregnancy and maternity, race, religion or belief, sex and sexual orientation. OK, so all of these things protected. But I always make clients that I work with very aware that the law is very important but it, for example, uses language that is considered outdated by groups it protects. So say, for example, here, things like gender reassignment, it's considered quite outdated. It also doesn't go far enough in terms of the protected categories. OK, so to avoid always trying to play catch up. So if you always try to play catch up, you're always behind. You're not at the cutting edge of inclusion. Right. So to avoid trying to play catch up and to be known as a truly inclusive space, it's better to be ahead of the law and leading the way in inclusion. So yes, always keep the UK 2010 Equality Act in mind. This is really important legally to avoid getting into trouble with the law legally, tribunals, whatever else. But we should go beyond this, okay? This is 2010, it's outdated, right? And something to note that class or socioeconomic position, for example, is missing, okay? The other things that are missing, class is one of those. So there are the same legal protections in place, uh, relating to class, relating to socioeconomic position, as there are for the characteristics listed on the screen. So I do a lot of consultancy around a lot of things, but also a lot of, a lot around class. It's, it's really important that we don't let class be left off the table. Um, I've created a number of free resources, uh, including a series of accessible podcasts about working class inclusion, including a number of free measures. So these are free resources which, with things that you can do for free. So it's a bit of a win win there. Um, and while they were created for the UK film industry, there are a number of resources, such as on inclusive staffing, which can apply far beyond. So I'm going to share details for these at the end, as well as some details for other resources. OK. It's important as well. So these are important when we're thinking about aspects of identity, things that are legally protected or not. It's also important for everybody to think about how aspects of our identity such as our gender, our race, our sexuality, these don't operate in a vacuum. They don't operate, they have never operated and can never operate in a vacuum. Law Professor Kimberly Crenshaw coined or created the term intersectionality in an academic text, in an academic text, sorry, published in 1989. It's about how aspects of identity do not and cannot operate in a vacuum. She was inspired by second wave feminism of the 1970s and early 80s and how white women in the West would often speak up wholesale for or on behalf of old women, uh, sort of all women, sorry. So somebody was saying uh, uh, previously that, you know, we have to be careful that we don't speak on behalf of other groups, that we listen to them. And that was one of the issues that, you know, white women and often middle class, class white women in the West were speaking up on behalf of wholesale all women, but not all experiences are equal because of these intersections of identity. So Crenshaw made clear that white women may be oppressed as women, but they're also privileged because they're white. So there's a way that they're oppressed as women, a way that they're privileged because they're white. So they're not dealing with racism, systemic racism, the racialized aspect of capitalism and so on. And of course, these intersect. So our whole identity comprises ways that we are privileged, 
and ways that we oppress, are oppressed. So just for a couple of examples, I'm privileged as a white person, but I'm oppressed as a woman. I'm oppressed as a lesbian, as someone with a disability, as someone who was raised in poverty, although I'm very aware and I acknowledge the fact that I'm now privileged to have a career, the finances, access to a wide range of culture that I have, despite being raised in poverty. By considering and including all aspects, we ensure that every characteristic of each person and therefore every person is included. And a holistic approach to inclusion is really the only approach that we should take to inclusion. We have to be, we always have to be holistic, okay? So with that background uh, covered, sorry, there was a minor tech issue there where I had to sort of scroll up and scroll back. So with that background covered, okay, so thinking about the ethical case, the business case, the legal case and being, of being inclusive, what does an inclusive leader need? An inclusive, inclusive leader needs to be self-aware and to be authentic. This means being aware of their strengths as well as their power. Okay, they've got to be aware of their strengths, but also their power and their privileges which goes back to Crenshaw's work on intersectionality, which is why Crenshaw's work is so very important. It's also, as well as knowing their strengths, their power, their privileges, it's known about their weaknesses. And it's been willing to be vulnerable and admit mistakes. So they've got to be vulnerable, they can admit mistakes, which is also key to the psychological safety that we discussed. They're also aware of their biases. It's always good to learn or refresh your knowledge of various types of bias. And we'll speak a little bit about this towards the end of the session. An inclusive leader is socially aware. They recognize that the playing field is not equal and they strive for inclusion. They seek a range of diverse perspectives and opinions to avoid groupthink. Obviously groupthink that we spoke about where everybody comes up with similar ideas because of similar backgrounds, perhaps similar experience, or those people who have different perspectives don't feel comfortable or confident speaking up because of the group and the groupthink situation. An inclusive leader isn't afraid to challenge the status quo, outdated policies and such like, so they don't just maintain the status quo. An inclusive leader actively listens and learns. An inclusive leader is not a know-it-all, they actively listen and they learn. They listen to understand, not only to uncover facts, but also feelings about a situation, and they take those feelings seriously. They listen to understand values and how these align or don't with the values of an organization. Inclusive leaders know they don't have all of the answers and they're always open to learning from others and doing better while giving credit to those they learn from. Oh, it's absolutely horrid when senior people can profit from other people's ideas, whether in terms of financial profit, promotion, publicity, the way that they're seen, their reputation, but then they don't give that credit for ideas. So they learn from others. They can carry those ideas forward and they always give credit. Inclusive leaders know they don't have all of the answers I mentioned, so they always know they don't have all the answers and they'll give this credit. Inclusive leaders are available to listen to everyone in their organization. So they're not, not just listening to the people who are, you know, perhaps at the top of the tree in the hierarchy. They're not just listening to those people, they're listening to everybody, okay? That's really, really important. They create a situation where everyone feels comfortable sharing their thoughts, ideas, or concerns with them. This could be directly, or it could be through a system where that information can and will reach them. So everybody needs to be in a position in an organization where they feel comfortable sharing thoughts, feelings, ideas. There has to be some route that they can share these and feel comfortable doing so. Of course, accessibility comes in here as well, but things need to be accessible. Everyone needs to be able to share their opinions and their ideas. They will then, an inclusive leader will then act appropriately. They'll ensure that everyone feels heard and that action is taken. So it's unacceptable not to take action after valid concerns are raised. So people or somebody raise, raises very valid concerns. We know that this is an issue. Those people are investing their time, their energy, their emotions into providing information, evidence, feedback, but then everything stays the same. How do people feel? So they lose faith in leadership, they lose faith in the, the culture, faith in the culture it makes things worse because these issues then fester, okay? And people think, well, what's the point in speaking up? So you can lose people or you can at least lose their contributions. An inclusive leader creates positive connections and collaborations. They favor, they always favor, and I think it's really important in the current climate, they favor diversity over division, always diversity over division, okay? They don't ever create situations in which oppressed groups or minority or minoritized groups are put against each other. 
So we want di uh, di diversity and a welcoming approach over di uh, division, okay? So they help to create bonds, more diverse networks, and a number of studies show that connection is directly linked to well-being, whether this is connection in the workplace, in activities we do in our private lives. Connection is directly correlates with well-being, okay? We need to feel connected. We need to feel included and part of something connected. Inclusive leaders also know that these collaborations and networks should not only be open to those with the most power and privilege in an organisation. So these networks, these collaborations should be available and open to all. Inclusive leaders are also aware that inclusion is not just, for example, an HR issue or a staff network issue, but it's about everyone in an organisation. Everyone has the part to play in the inclusion and inclusive culture within an organisation. An inclusive leader also invests resources in inclusion. They invest time, money, energy, including their own, okay, their own energy. It's not just about pushing this out of somebody else's shoulders, but, in, you know, using their own energy, their own time as well. They're key, an inclusive leader is key to, to organisational culture. But they don't just go for that flags and food, I quote, this flags and food approach, okay? They don't go for a surface level approach to inclusion. This is where, for example, a flag is flown, a lunch is provided, a speaker talks, and these things are all good and they're all, you know, useful and they're nice, but nothing really changes, right? Nothing really changes if we just go for the flags and food approach. There's a speaker, there's a flag, there's a lunch. We need to delve deeper uh, to organisational culture. And th th these things are important, but there needs to be more. There needs to be a depth. But an inclusive leader can collect relevant data, relevant information, both quantitative and qualitative. Again, this also goes back to this idea of listening and listening to everyone. But they also know that data is not enough. The culture needs to be a safe one, okay? Data is not useful, okay? Data isn't useful and feedback isn't useful if some people feel nervous to feedback, if some people feel like they can't speak about an issue. It all goes back to the culture that's created, the psychological safety that's created. So data isn't just enough. The culture needs to be a safe one, okay? Data is irrelevant in many ways if there are some people who aren't contributing to that because they feel like they can't, okay? Inclusive leaders respond to issues swiftly and fairly. They ensure that changes happen, okay, when needed, and that these are really something really very measured, okay, and that, uh, that whenever changes happen, these are communicated to everyone. I contributed to a publication on quarters and data collection and diversity and inclusion work, which I'll direct you to at the end. An inclusive leader isn't nice. Nice is such a problematic term. It's someone who doesn't challenge the status quo, it's often about being perceived in this way as being perceived as nice rather than doing the right thing. It's not pro uh, challenging problematic behaviour or problematic culture. Good, inclusive leaders don't concern themselves with just being nice, but rather with being kind, fair, equitable of doing the right thing, not only doing what they think looks best for them. Inclusive leaders don't brush issues under the rug. And they understand that someone uh, exposing a problem is not them, it's not the person who exposed the problem, posing a problem, but rather raising some red flags to organisational culture with a will to making this culture more healthy. So part of creating an, organi an inclusive culture, sorry, is to recognise and respond in a measured way to wrongdoing. While some wrongdoing is more obvious, and it can be obvious to many people, and there are obvious legal repercussions of some wrongdoing, some wrongdoing is only obvious to those on the receiving end or who have similar lived experience as those on the receiving end. A microaggression is a statement, action or incident, which is indirect, subtle or unintentional discrimination against members of an oppressed or marginalised group. The term was coined by Chester M. Pierce, who was a Harvard professor and psychiatrist, and they recognize, he recognised that the covert, there was covertly racist ways that white people would act towards black people in North America. So not just blatant acts of discrimination, but smaller areas. Okay? It's since been applied to a whole range of other people. Tiffany Jayner and Michael Barron have recently written about these, calling them subtle acts of exclusion. And some organisations prefer this because they think it's sort of less confrontational. Okay. So microaggressions can be verbal, what people say. An example of this would be an RP or received pronunciation speaker. That is someone who speaks in an English accent, considered neutral, although we know that it's not neutral, mocking the regional accent of a working class person. They can be behavioural gestures such as a man rolling his eyes whenever a woman contributes in a meeting. 
And they can be environmental, part of the decor of the workplace, such as all statues and artwork, only created by and only depicting white people. And it's always good to be an active bystander if you feel comfortable being one. So an active bystander doesn't meet issues with silence. So what happens if we witness or are on the receiving end of a microaggression then? Here's a tool that you, not just leaders, but anyone can use if you are on the receiving end. Okay. You can address it on behalf of yourself, on behalf of another person, on behalf of another group, um, as an active bystander, as I said, or as a leader. So the aid model, action, impact, do. So action. When you did or said X, you give a specific example of behaviour. Impact, it meant that person or group of people, okay, might feel or might have felt why, or it made me feel why. You give the impact of the behaviour. In the future, can you instead do or say Z? You suggest a different way to behave. There are positives of this approach. It means that one specific incident is addressed. You're not saying to somebody, you're sexist, you're racist, you're homophobic. You're telling them one thing that they did or said one thing, okay? This can help them to be less defensive. You're telling them how it made you or someone else feel. Most, most kind people, most decent people don't want to make others feel bad. They don't want to hurt others. And you're also giving them a concrete way of how to uh, behave in future. Okay, this isn't left open-ended or vague. You're saying, okay, don't do X, do Z instead, please. So I'll give you an example that you can think of. Okay, this next. So Teresa's just joined your staff network, comes to our first event. One longtime member of the network, John, looks at her and asks, aren't you cold? That skirt's a bit short, isn't it? And Teresa looks uncomfortable. You have a number of options here as an active bystander. You can call it out. You can address the issue right there in front of everyone. This can be useful to get matters dealt with quickly and also to ensure everyone is aware of what is and isn't acceptable. So what is and isn't acceptable. It doesn't work if you're speaking up to support somebody who might not want to, you to address the issue right there. So Teresa looks uncomfortable. Does she want this to carry on? Does she want this to close down right now and maybe be addressed later on? To call in means to address the issue in private. And this was what can be most useful and usually how a leader would do things. And no matter what with this model, you can always circle back. So if someone says, I do something, you think, ah, I should have said something. I regret not saying anything. I should have said this. I should have said that. Circle back. It's never too late. Okay. This is what an inclusive culture needs. We don't let things pass by. So let's assume that Teresa doesn't say anything. She's new. She doesn't know the culture. She might think this is acceptable here. So we could call John in. So we speak to him privately. We could say action. When you commented on clothing earlier today, impact. It meant that not only the person singled out might have felt uncomfortable, but all female colleagues might have felt uncomfortable to, uh, to witness a man neg negatively address a colleague's clothing so easily. Do, in the future, can you instead welcome new members to, of the staff network and not negatively comment on people's clothing, people's dress or their appearance? Okay, in this kind of instance, people might say, oh, it's just banter. But you know what? Banter is only banter and it's only funny if somebody's like, everyone's laughing. And if somebody isn't laughing, it's not banter. I just, I'm going to give you something that you can think about at home. So this is just an exercise that you might want to do at home later on. I'm aware most of you are already at home, but later on when you've got time, Write down, it can be really useful to write down or think of the names of five or 10 people who you trust the most. Five or 10 people who are not family members who you trust the most, all right? Think about these. And once you've done that, and don't kind of tilt it in this direction on purpose, but then once you've done that, and be honest with yourself, you're not sharing this with anyone, you can be totally honest with yourself. You wanna consider the intersections of their identity. So the ethnicity of these people, ages, sexualities, genders, religions, disability statuses, class, and so on. Think about how diverse this group of people is, right? What might it tell you about your own bias or biases? And what might it mean for group think in your decision making? So just to conclude then, okay, just to think about, you know, a quick summary, thinking about what we've covered today, with the things that I've, I've spoken about today. A culture is only inclusive if everyone feels included, valued and safe. So it's only inclusive if everyone, every single person feels included, valued and safe. This begins with leadership. An inclusive leader is authentic, socially aware, actively listens, creates positive connections and invests resources in inclusion. Everyone plays a role in creating inclusion. So it's not just about the leader. The leadership can set the tone, really vitally important, but every single member of a workplace, organisation, group plays a role in creating this inclusion. Part of this is by being active bystanders. So we speak up when we see an issue, when we witness an issue, but it's also about being mindful of our own words, 
actions and biases. You're more than welcome to get in touch if you want to do so. My LinkedIn is Dr. Leanne Dawson. The email for my consultancy and my consultancy business is Leanne at drleannedawson.uk. I mentioned earlier on I have some free diversity inclusion resources. There's the Work and Class Inclusion podcast. There's a link there. How helpful are targets and quotas? And if you search Dr. Leanne Dawson on a search engine, you'll get a number of free open access publications. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen and enjoy the rest of the sessions. Thank you so much, Leanne. I know I'll be reaching out with so many <laughs> weird and wonderful questions on this because it's amazing. Please, please topic. do so. Please do so. Um, so our next uh chair is uh my fellow NEC rep, uh Cecile Wright, who is a professor in uh, Nottingham University. There you are, Cecile. I'll let you take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ashley. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the actual topical theme that I will be chairing is uh, social mobility and equality, how to create impactful change in relation to this structural matter. We witnessed during the week, we were observers of the those of us who were observers, and I'm sure the world was uh, observers of the American election during the week. And we witnessed, in terms of the election outcome, what could be described politically as a tsunami or a paradigm shift, political paradigm shift in terms of voting, voting patterns, and clearly the shift to a change in, in the administration that will be coming in in January. So the success of Donald Trump uh, party now, uh, what transpired with, with respect to this paradigm, political paradigm shift in terms of the Republican Party led by Donald Trump will keep uh, scholars, academics of political science and uh, sociologists in work for many decades in terms of undertaking the analysis of what happened, why, why the outcome, unexpected outcome. Of course, it was expected. Of course, the results, the reasons by the, for the outcome uh, are complicated ones. However, I, as a sociologist, would say that at the end of the day, it was about the economy. So basically, the outcome was influenced by matters of social mobility and social inequality. People, irrespective of other identities, just felt that they economically were not in a good place. And, and another party was able to offer them the hope of being in a good place. So as a prelude, to this session, what the session is attempting to do is to engage in a debate about a structural matter, the structural matter of social mobility. What is it as a concept? Social mobility and equality, what do we mean? How do we know whether uh, uh, a mobility is taking place, is healthy? How do we identify it? How do we identify social uh, inequal, um, economic inequality, and what can we do about it? These structural matters. We have two uh, brilliant contributors, speakers to this debate today. We have Graham Atherton, Vice Principal of Ruskin College, Oxford, and heads uh, Ruskin Institution for Social Equity. And our second speaker is uh, Councillor Dr. 
Kindy Sandu uh, from Coventry City Council, who also sits on the NEC of the Cooperative Party. So who is likely to go first? Can we invite Graham Atherton, please? To of course, Cecile, yes, address. absolutely. Happy to go first. Yes. Thank you. The audience. Thank you. Thank you, Cecile. Thank you for your introduction. And thank you uh, to the, the co-op for inviting me today. And, and what an excellent event it's been so far. I've been lucky to, to hear most of the speakers, um, and particularly the last presentation from Leanne, I thought was very interesting and very insightful as well. So I've just got a few minutes, really, where I'm going to tell you a bit about the work that I do and then offer some thoughts, I guess, about social mobility and also thoughts about how I might relate to the work of the Cooperative Party. And as, um, as Cecile kindly said, I'm Vice Principal at Ruskin College, Oxford. Uh, many of you, I think, uh, familiar with the Labour movement will know about Ruskin. Uh, it's our 125th year anniversary this year of Ruskin. Ruskin was set up and still remains a college committed to providing a route into an Oxford-based education, a higher education, further education for those and working class backgrounds and also at home for progressive thoughts. Uh, as many of you some may know as well, the first National Liberations Movement Conference was in 1970 at Ruskin. We've had other landmark events uh, for those in the progressive community at Ruskin uh, over our lifetime. Uh, but I also, as well as Ruskin, lead something called the National Education Opportunities Network, or NEON, which is a national organisation supporting widening access to higher education, which we set up about 13, 14 years ago over 100 universities as members. And I'm going to talk a little bit really today about my work at Ruskin, my work in NEON, and my work in this area. This work for me, I guess, on a personal level has been a calling. Uh, I was, uh, again, talking social mobility, I guess I was a uh, want to benefit from, from that, whatever it's, it's understood as. Um, I uh, live in London now, but as those of you uh, who are sharp on accents will know that uh, this is a London accent. And uh, I come from Blackpool. Uh, and I was the first in my family to go to university. Blackpool, as many of you will know, has a lot of challenges. And uh, I grew up in a council estate in Blackpool and went to Oxford. So uh, it was a massive journey for me. It's been a calling for the last 30 years for me to try and pursue and lead activities to give opportunities to young people and adults who come from the backgrounds that I have came from myself. Uh, but it's been a huge challenge. And I, I think that even now, despite uh, years of activity, both led by uh, Labour as a government through the 2000s and, and continued as much as we can under the last administration, we still see huge differences in the ability of those to progress uh, to different parts of the economy uh, from different backgrounds, um, particularly in our work uh, in terms of supporting progression to higher education for those from uh, lower socioeconomic groups. We've seen actually for the first time uh, since we cut data was collected 16, 17 years ago, a decline in the last year, the percentage of young people who are eligible for free school meals going on to higher education. Uh, and despite the work we've tried to do, there's still a 20% gap between those going to higher education in receipt of free school meals and those not in receipt of free school meals. And laid upon that, there's huge regional differences. Differences don't necessarily map onto this idea of a north-south divide either. In Swindon, for instance, only 14% of young people from free school backgrounds go to higher education. And it's worth thinking, ref reflecting on that. Because we get a lot of narrative nowadays about everybody goes to university, everybody gets a chance to go to university. Well, they don't. Uh, and, you know, if you're in Swindon and you're claiming free school meals, you've got a 30% chance of going. And I'll, I'll give you a, a wager, the numbers of people on this call benefit from university education, I'll say it's well over 13%, uh, including myself, of course. And of course, in Westminster, 70% uh, of young people for this world backgrounds go to HE. Not that those in Westminster don't have challenges, but there's huge regional differences. And we see other huge challenges in our work as well, particularly with regards to older learners. Adult learning uh, is a huge mechanism of allowing people throughout their lives to think about how they want to progress economically. And indeed, socially as well. It has huge social economic benefits, adult learning. We've seen in the last 10 years over 4 million uh, less adult learners in this, in this country. That's a huge decline and a decline of funding of 40% for adult learning. 
Uh, and that's another area which I, we, again, at Ruskin are, are very concerned and our, our work is focused upon. We do hope that under this new Labour administration, as much as we see activities to support those to go to higher education, we equally, perhaps even more so, see uh, activities to encourage adult learning, which would be a huge uh, swell of opportunities for lots of people who never had the chance to progress through school and other reasons, for whatever reasons and, and challenges they've had in their lives. And we would say, I guess, in terms of, of this question of social mobility, if I go on to our final remarks about what to do, I just reflect on the term for a moment, because this is a challenging issue. I think Cecile alluded to this a little bit in her excellent introduction, because social mobility as a phrase doesn't really mean much to those people you're supporting to be socially mobile. We did some work around three or four years ago in a number of different communities, speaking to educationalists and others, about the idea of social mobility. Uh, and there was an issue, many felt that for some of the young people and others they were speaking to, social mobility to them meant leaving their area. And they didn't want to leave that area. They wanted to progress and, and have aspirations, ambitions, economically and socially. They didn't want to leave the area. It's a difficult thing. I mean, we know what we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to look at, but the, the, the language is important and language of aspiration, opportunity as well is, is important to think about. And it's notable that uh, Labour hasn't uh, kind of focused on the phrase social mobility thus far. And I'm not sure if that's because of that or other reasons, but I'm interested to have a discussion about that, uh, what that means in the context of of, uh, of those in the audience and the eight regions and, and organisations which in which they work. Uh, but I think in terms of moving forward, um, I, I think that obviously for us, we're hopeful that this new government will, will bring a renewed attitude towards supporting uh, particularly progression to higher education for those from different backgrounds. It's been a tough time for the higher education sector and that narrative uh, in recent years. I mean, we, we, we have a community of people across the country who work tirelessly to try and provide opportunities for young people and others from backgrounds where they have had opportunities such as that in the past. And um, we were told more than once by the last government our work was a waste of time. So I think we're hopefully a different message than this government. But at the same time, I think, you know, from the cooperative party standpoint, I think that there's still lots to do in supporting and shaping from advocacy where the new government takes their work on social mobility. Because while I think there's a genuine concern there and approach, and it should be from, from, from Labour and cooperative uh, members and members of Parliament and others. I still think there's work to do in, in really deciding and establishing a coherent policy agenda where that's concerned. Um, the opportunity mission is, is, is a welcome focus on what opportunity means, but there, there is some high-level commitment, but there's lots to do there, I think, both locally, regionally, nationally, in shaping what that can look like. And for the cooperative party standpoint, uh, I, I welcome the equality groups and networks that you have there uh, within the, the party. It might be worth thinking about whether you want to expand the networks to think about social mobility and issues for social economic difference as well. And then intersectionality as well. Let's remember that as well. The, the, the intersectionality of social economic background and gender and disability or ability and ethnicity all shape this very complex question. Uh, and I think that interaction and intersectionality is crucial. Uh, in terms of understanding whatever policy response or practical response we see to that. Uh, I'm going to finish in a moment to hand over to my, my next speaker, but I welcome questions. I, I'm glad that you've had the opportunity to ask me to be here, and I hope the Cooperative Party will take forward this commitment. I'm sure they've seen this through having this event today. I'll have to use this seal. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Graham, for that really eloquent uh, overview of the debate. Uh, uh, and a possible, possible political intervention. Okay, I will take questions by all means, uh, but I'd prefer if we have the second speaker and then uh, I will invite questions. So Rachel, I've got you down here. So once we've heard Kindy speak, uh, I'll come to you first. Okay, our next speaker is Kindy. Uh, Councillor uh, Dr Kindy Sandu um, from Coventry City Council, Cabinet Member for Skills, uh, Education Skills, clearly a fundamental area of activity if we're talking about uh, uh, equipping 
giving the tools, giving the means by which uh, people, young people, are giving options and choice to progress in life. Kindy, please address our audience. Thank you. Thanks, Cecile. It's great to see you again. And um, it's great to be here at a, a co-op event and a very important event. Um, I've heard lots of uh, inspiring speeches this uh, morning, and I hope that I can uh, follow. I was asked to um, speak a bit about myself. Um, I guess my, my story is very much kind of follows what Graham <laughs> has, has just talked about. Um, today, I'm a, a counsellor, a labour and cooperative counsellor in a ward in Coventry called Earlsdon. Um, at the time when I got uh, elected, it was considered out of the 18 wards, 17th most likely to go Labour. But I won after uh, 22 years of solid Tory um, reign in, in that ward. And yes, I'm a cabinet member for education and skills. I'm also an academic at Coventry University. Um, studying, um, researching, I should say, uh, gender-based violence, uh, migration and intersections of uh, race, gender, etc. So my story is really, you know, I'm a child of immigrants. Uh, my mom was a child bride, something that we don't often talk about uh, in this country. She was 15, not quite 15, actually, when she was married to my dad. She was certainly 15 when she came to this country. She had three years of schooling. My dad had none. So he was not able to read or write in any language. So you can imagine the kind of job that he got in this in this country, in our country. So my access to social mobility, if you like, was a very big challenge. I didn't get free school meals, even though I was entitled to it. We didn't live in a council house, even though we should have. We lived in a slum because we had no access to um, a council house. And in terms of one of the reasons I joined the co-op party is the way because of the way my mum and dad lived some of those values. So for example, getting their first house where they borrowed money off their peers uh, and paid it back um, to buy a house, even though it was a slum, no hot water, et cetera. Um, and they paid it back without interest. And then the next family bought their home. And, and that to me was the very kind of epitome of what the, the co-op values are. You know, I face many barriers um, for others going to university, you know, for example, is filling in a form and deciding uh, for me, it didn't quite work out like that, you know, so it wasn't just being the first in my in my family to go to university, but when I have generations of my family who have no schooling and so don't understand, and indeed I didn't really understand what go going to university meant and all that social and cultural capital, those sorts of terms that I now have come to understand. But what I did know was that education was my way out. It was my way out of um, if I had um, a marriage that didn't work out, I could fend for myself financially. And so I chose to study computer science at, at university. And again, it was because of being a woman and being a woman in poverty that I chose that, that subject. Um, so I tried to live, I've been an activist all my adult life, um, always, um, did voluntary work and um, mainly in the area of domestic violence, an activist in terms of race politics. And when I had uh, this um, job, which uh, for a company called Marconi, where I managed about 50 uh, software engineers, I, ha I wanted to live my politics. Um, and so one of the things I did, for example, was democratise pay in, in Marconi for, for, the, for my department. Uh, because up until then, it was one manager that decided for their um, their team member, and I didn't feel that that was acceptable or indeed met my values. Um, I left the corporate sector, uh, worked, then decided to go into the public sector and ended up doing a PhD. So today, what I'm really going to talk about um, is something that I've been asked to, to talk about, uh, highlighting a barrier in social mobility really that isn't currently protected by law, and that's about care experience. Um, and it's about those who 
with care experience face, face a huge range of barriers in adult life. So, for example, care leavers leave at, at the age of 18, whereas on average for everyone else, um, we leave home at, at the age of 27. In Coventry, we have 600 people who we classify as care leavers. As a council, we have a corporate responsibility. So I just want to give some context about why I'm, I'm talking about this. 33% of homeless people have been in care. Only 6% of care leavers go to university, but 45% have mental health issues and 25% of the prison population have been those who've had care experience. So why did we decide to do this in Coventry? Well, really, we, we, I believe we do the best that we can. We have a good offer, but I wanted to make Coventry the best place to be a child in care and be a care leaver. And also we had the independent review of the children's social care that was headed by Jock, Josh McAllister, who is now um, an MP. The, the report concluded that the government should make care experience a protected characteristic following the consultation with care experience people in devolved administrations. And they recommended that new legislation should be passed, which broadens the corporate responsibilities across a wider range of public bodies that extend beyond the council. We have the public sector duty that obviously requires public bodies to eliminate unlawful discrimination. So there is a legislation that slits, slots into, into it. Within Coventry, we were often hearing from people who've got care experience uh, in our scrutiny process, also in our corporate parenting board, but also within the Care Leavers Forum that we held. You know, people use this term uh, experts in experience. And I think if we follow through with that, it's really about listening to people. I know that 102 authorities now have um, passed similar motions. And so, again, I want we wanted to show leadership within Coventry. So we passed a motion to increase, increase the profile and opportunities for care experienced young people in Coventry. And so what does that mean? It means within the motion we wanted to resolve so that uh, care experience is treated as a protected characteristic, not just within the council, but with all other bodies. We proactively want to listen and uh, seek out opportunities for um, care experienced people within the uh, council. And we've asked senior leaders to work with the Human Resources Department. We're writing to all public bodies that represent the city uh, and the Chamber of Commerce to make them aware of this motion and issues facing care experienced people. We're writing to the uh, Secretary of State as well as our three local MPs. We only passed the motion uh, a few weeks ago. It's still early days and yet we have to see the impact of it and certainly making sure that we monitor what, what the impact is. So that's my end of my speech. So thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, to speak. Uh, thank you so much um, for that, uh, Akindi. Uh, my goodness, the illustration uh, in terms of your biography of real live uh, social mobility. <laughs> wow, uh, impressive. And of course, thank you very much for select uh, for highlighting the gaps in the Equality Act with respect to certain groups that experience structural difficulty, care, um, care leavers in terms of indices of deprivation is well known. So thank you for highlighting that. And incidentally, the Equality Act ought to embed class inequality so that's the main if you can tackle the class then you can tackle other intersecting elements uh, unfortunately we only have time for uh, uh, one round of very quick questions with quick responses if you don't mind so if we can go to Rachel followed by Mary and then Ellie please so Rachel your question quick question Mary and then Ellie thank you I'm going to try to keep this brief I want to talk about a uh, a form of barrier to social mobility that doesn't have a name. And the fact it doesn't have a name is kind of the problem, which is geography and the barriers faced by working class and poorer children 
in isolated communities who don't have direct, you know, they're not within the radar of the big companies giving internships or work, working class experiences. And therefore their, their perspective on what they can do as an adult is limited by the fact that they live in a remote community, their parents don't have a car. And actually all, all they know is what they see on TV. Yeah, That's okay. About- thank, yeah, thank you for that, Rachel. Uh, Mary, please, and then Ellie. Um, yes. Um, I've wondered for some time if there's if we could um, have an innovative project to um, assist uh, people um, with learning uh, with literacy and learning English. And I've got experience as a school teacher and with adult literacy. Remember the the days of the um, Bob Hoskins um, uh, literacy project where they they found all these people who'd been sent off to the countryside in the war, sort of hidden tranche of illiterate people who were who had to come out. And um, it, the, the classes were free, I believe. I don't know if the, the Labour government can find the funding for this. So I was thinking if we could work out some cooperative way of doing it, because I learned a method of, of, uh, of, of, of teaching people English uh, in my in my um, teaching experience, uh, so okay. anyway, I just yeah. want to put it out yeah. there. Thank you, Mary. About. That's very helpful. Uh, and then Ellie, please. Yeah, um, I think um, the concept of social mobility is falling on difficult times for lots of different reasons, and I think that many people feel that it is a deceit and a conceit as a concept in that they are realizing that if they get their heads down even those that get their qualifications in university education it doesn't equal a job for life and if like me you become a parent carer to two children who don't fit with high needs um, you get punched down on and then awoke to social injustices and institutional harm is it time to talk about social justice and social innovation rather than social mobility okay uh so thank you ellie right very quickly please our uh, our speakers um uh geography as a barrier uh interlinked with class to social mobility uh the need to address skills literacy uh in terms of adult skills literacy and language and finally uh, the notion of social mobility is problematic because it really doesn't capture the essence of what's going on. OK, uh, uh, sure. Graham and then uh, Kindy, please. Thank you, Cecil. Yeah, on the first question about geography, and again, I entirely agree with Rachel. Uh, our work in the past has, has shown that those young people in different geographical communities, particularly remote communities, don't have the ability to see and experience those broader set of potential work trajectories, etc. which is why we, we pressed and work with Department of Education and Government at the moment in our area of work to get back to more regionally focused uh, policy agenda, which we didn't have before, because only that regionally focused policy agenda would pick up some of those issues. On Mary's point, as I alluded to earlier on, adult learning, adult education is crucial. Uh, I'm not sure what the cooperative party can do in that area, but certainly from an advocacy point of view, pressing to get funding, steer back to support adult learning at local level, at community level, as much da- as much as a devolved level as possible, will hopefully uh, enable the sort of ideas that Mary has, po- hopefully with that kind of policy support and the cooperative part to come to fruition. In terms of the concept itself, uh, yes, indeed. I mean, in, in terms of, of the futures, I mean, I guess the job for life concept, it depends which area you go into. But social mobility, yeah, as I said in my presentation, uh, it's not a term that means much to those who you want to support. Uh, justice, social justice is another idea, but I think it's also it's broader than that. I think the particular concerns regarding how we enable all to progress means something much more inclusive in what we do there, and that does come down to policy focus and policy support and ensuring Labour doesn't lose sight of that in what it does in the moment. It doesn't have an agenda. So the cooperative parties, there's a gap. I'll leave it at that for you. Yeah, thank you, Graham. Uh, Kindy, please. Yeah, thanks for your all your questions, Rachel, Mary and Ellie. I think the first one, Rachel, I think there's lots that we can do. Uh, so, for example, when I worked at Marconi, uh, we went around different um, parts of the, the world, South Wales, for example, Liverpool, etc., 
going to those working class areas and we just put up adverts that saying did you fail your a levels right so we didn't look at skills we looked at competencies and how that some some young people especially from working class backgrounds don't get um to pass certain qualifications because of all sorts of reasons so i would say things like chamber of commerce i would say the council organizations like that that should be pushing that so i would push your your message to, towards them um the one about literacy absolutely agree why wouldn't i i you know with my family i i've you've, you've heard my my backstory but i think literacy has to look at things like the cost to get there child care the environment you know quite often it's women who don't have the literacy skills and is it a safe environment for them and it's looking at all those other barriers to support to support literacy um yeah social mobility in fact a colleague of mine was talking about we're writing a paper on on the windrush scandal and and he was talking to me about social mobility i tend to use the term access to equity because i feel you know people often say there's a door there you know but for me how do you know there is a door there how do you open it and what's the other side so for me it is about access to equity but whatever we choose to call it it has to be about working class people, all the different uh, marginalised communities that many of us come from, from, and especially because of austerity, especially we have a whole generation of young kids who are austerity generation, and that's what we have to tackle. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you to both our speakers, Kindy and Graham. Thank you for uh, the informative uh, information that you have shared with us, and I hope people found the debate uh, interesting. Clearly, there's lots more to be done. Thank you. I'll hand you back now to Jennifer. Jennifer? Hello. Hi. <laughs> thank you very much, Cecile. And I want to first say thank you very much to all of our incredible speakers today. Um, it really has been an absolute pleasure to be to be having all of these incredible voices speaking and very diverse voices at that. I think we've had uh, people from almost every community uh, be able to contribute today. I'm actually going to speak a little bit about the work of the the party itself, working with our staff networks in particular as we wrap up today. Um, you will see that the wonderful chairs for our sessions today were all of, um, part of our NEC and specifically they were our equalities reps. So I want to particularly thank them. So thank you to Ellie Ormsby, who is our youth NEC rep. Thank you to Ashley Holstead, our LGBT NEC rep and Cecile, who is the rep for our black, Asian and minority ethnic uh, members. And also not able to chair today, we also have our Sandra who is our uh, representative for our disabled members. So these are all part of our NEC and they speak for our members um, to make sure those voices are heard. In addition to that, as I hope all of you know, we have our five equalities networks and these networks are the Black, Asian and minority ethnic cooperators, the LGBTQ plus cooperators, the Cooperative Party Disability Network, the Cooperative Party Women's Network, and the Cooperative Party Youth Network. And there's a particular reason that I want to bring them up today. So first off, not everybody is aware that our networks are not something that you have to actively opt into. If you are a member of the party and you are age 30 or younger, you are already a member of our youth network. If you identify as a woman, then you already are a member of our women's network. For the network for Black, Asian and minority ethnic members, LGBTQ plus members and disabled members, you do need to make sure you have updated your equalities data so that we have that. And if you have self-identified, then you also are automatically a member of those networks. So if you didn't know you were, you are, and we would love to see you participate even more and share your voice. And there is a particular opportunity to do that coming up because we are going to be having elections for our steering committees for each of the networks. Each of our networks has a steering committee made up of 12 people and they are gender balanced. So at least half of those 12 have to be identifying as women. So those nominations will be opening on Monday.
So a little bit about what our steering committees do, because these networks are very, very large and they need a little bit of direction. So the steering committee is responsible for setting the program. They help to set up events and run some fabulous events. They also lead on a lot of the campaigns that we've seen happening and they also each have their own budget so they have an opportunity to spend a bit of that budget as well to do what they can to try and ensure our members are heard so all of these are tremendous opportunities to share your voices and also to help lead others so i very much encourage anyone who is thinking this might be for them to have a look you will be seeing an email hit your inbox on monday so that is when our nominations will open. You can self-nominate and then elections will open at the end of the month. Now, if you still want a little bit more information, there will be two information sessions on the networks and on the elections that will be happening throughout the month. And they will also be advertised in that email. So you can click on the links in there, get registered, find out a bit, ask a few questions, and learn a bit more about what we do and how you can help create some of that cooperative change that we all want to see. So if you have any questions about that before, you can also go ahead and email through to the network's email address or email myself as Equalities Officer. My name is Jennifer Hemingway, and you can find my email on the website, or we can pop that and the network's address into the chat as well. I want to once again thank everyone and thank you as well for your excellent questions. This has been a lovely conference this year. And thank you in particular to our keynotes, to Annalise Dodds and to Dr. Leanne Dawson for joining us today, as well as all of our speakers. Have a wonderful day and I look forward to hearing lots of you put yourselves forward to help run our networks. Thank you very much.